invite you to turn this morning once again to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Obviously, you start considering whether or not if you're a man and a member of this church, you start wondering whether or not it is the will of God for you. Some of you may like to take matters into your own hands and just well, my name's not on then. You don't have to worry about it. I hope you don't do that lightly. I trust you. Think of what we were singing this morning. Take my moments and my days. You're putting your whole life, your hands, your feet, your whole being. You put it before the Lord and you go back to what we dealt with, uh, not last week, but the week before Acts chapter 9, verse 6, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And he can lead providentially. He guides uh, through circumstances and various things. And it's not about high ambitions and lofty desires for ourselves. It's simply throwing ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, if I can help in any way, if you can use me in this way or that way or the other way, then here I am and help me to do it to the best of my ability. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we will, I trust, get then to the text that we did not get to last Lord's Day, and that the Lord will help us as we consider it. And again, we'll take time, I know that some time has gone from us already, but let's read from verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach, or into reproach, and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and that these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grieved, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus." These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Amen. May the Lord bless His infallible word to our hearts, even in the reading of it. Let's bow together in prayer. God, remember us this morning. It's much easier to sing what we are meant to be than to be what we are meant to be. We pray that Thou wilt, by the grace of God and by the Spirit who dwells within us, enable us more and more to be what Thou hast called us to be. At the very least, make us a very willing people to throw our lives into Thy hands and to pray with real sincerity, Lord, what wilt Thou have me to do? 
Help us then as we consider thy precious word as it has been given to guide and help in the organizing of the church. May it be helpful for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What is a deacon? What is a deacon? We have, over the past couple of weeks, considered what it is to serve, what it is to be a servant, and last week to apply it a little more specifically to the office of the deacon. In his Dictionary of Theological Terms, Dr. Cairns says that deacons are, quote, helpers of the elders of the church whose special responsibility is the oversight of the temporal and financial affairs of their local congregations and the care of the needs of the poor. So they help elders by, first, oversight of temporal and financial affairs, and secondly, care of the needs of the poor. This is their job description. And I sought to emphasize the second point last week, the first point as well, but especially the second point, because that point, the care of the poor, is, is more difficult for us. It's, I think, we're more inclined to consider some of the temporal and financial things a little more easily than it is to really care for the needs of people and to have that kind of concern that the Lord would have us to possess. It was the care of the poor that demanded the Christian church in Jerusalem to organize their leadership in such a way that would enable them to address the practical need found in Acts chapter 6. And we turned there last Lord's Day. They had to organize themselves. They had to structure their leadership in such a way to address this without diminishing the outreach of the church and the ministry of the Word of God from the apostles. And we saw from Acts chapter 6 that God blessed their efforts to awaken others to the gospel. We're told there that many of the priests were converted at that time. And I suggested to you part of what was involved there was this, this practical outworking of the church and the conviction of the spiritual leadership of the, uh, Jude, the, the Jews as, as they watched on and the, the, the Christian, this, Christ, this, this sect develops and they are manifesting care for those in need in a way that they are not. And conviction comes to their hearts. It makes a, 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 a way of interest. They become more interested. What are these people saying? They, 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 they now see what they're doing. And that makes a highway to listen to what they are now saying. And brings them to a saving knowledge of Christ. And this, of course, should be expected. John 13 35, Jesus says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I think Acts chapter 6 is a, an outworking of that text, that the love they had for the needy in their fellowship and their particular attention to the care that was necessary for the souls in that body manifested a love that was different and again spoke powerfully to the priests and spiritual leaders at the time. God has very little time for a form of religion that does not care for the needy within her ranks. And we saw that from Isaiah 58 as well. I'll not turn there again. And we are told by the Lord that the poor... We have always with us, Matthew 26, 11. And this is simply echoing, the Lord is reiterating what already the people of God understood if they were reading the Word. For in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11, Israel were told, For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor and to thy needy in thy land. That's very specific, of course. It's not to every land. They're not to, to throw their money around to all the people of the world. It's first to the household of faith, to use the language of Galatians. A priority for those that are our own. 
And when you read through the book of Deuteronomy, actually what struck me reading Deuteronomy 15 verse 11 again was I was thinking, you know, really, I mean, there's so many passages in Deuteronomy that should have filled Israel with a sense of expectation of prosperity. No one should have been going into the land thinking that they were going to be worse off. There, there's promises, clear indication that God was going to prosper them materially as well as spiritually in that land. And yet the instruction is given that the poor will never cease out of the land. And so while there was an expectation of prosperity for Israel, yet on an individual level they were to expect that not all would prosper materially. And so it is today. God's people generally, if they take the Word of God to heart and they give themselves to what they're gifted in and pursue life in the fashion that, that is scriptural, generally they, they will, might not be rich, but they'll get by. They'll, they'll generally be okay. And you can see that even in history. You can see, I mean, Scotland is obviously a land that I'm more familiar with than other lands. But you see that there in a marvelous degree, a land that was, had, was, had no sense of, of, of wealth or prosperity at all. Bar barbarians, basically. <laughs> You know, even the Romans could see that. You know, we'll just we'll just build the wall here and just, just leave them and just forget about it. But what a difference when the gospel took root, and and how the, this massive transformation, this this little part of the world with a very small populace, and as you, as you read through the development of 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 of, of Western uh, thought, Christian thought, especially Protestant Christian thought in terms of economics and engineering and, and, and literature and, and music even, you see this, this tiny little group of people. Wow, what, a, what an impact they've had. Prosperity. But not everyone. There's always going to be the needy in the land. In the past, the church was central to the economy of a community. With less government aid and state provisions, the deaconry was an essential part of the health of a community. God's people depended upon a functioning diaconate. They couldn't go to the state. There was no welfare. There was no help. They had to return to the people of God. And if they were the people of God, then they would be cared for, looked after. No doubt the church hasn't always carried out their responsibilities perfectly, but the rise of atheism over the last couple of centuries has led to big government statism and the construction of programs contrary to the divine will that are devoid of meaningful accountability and responsibility. There's no, there's no relationship anymore in the help that God promises to those that are needy. Service to the needy that was firstly to be carried out by the heads of families to their own. That's God's way of taking care of the needy. The first line of defense is the family, not the government. It is the family. Families care for their own. The second line of defense is the church. The people of God get cared for where the family are unable or at times, God forbid, at times unwilling to help the second line of defense is the church. And then at times we are moved by the Lord to help beyond the church. We may do that, and of course sometimes the church gets swept up in this desire to, to throw money around to the needy and, and feel like it all has to be focused upon those outside, but when scripturally, that's not the emphasis. It's the brother, the poor, the needy in thy land. You prioritize. And this is the work of deacons. It's to oversee all of this. And, and by its very nature, what God has put in place in terms of society as, as He has ordered it, what He has put in place is far more meaningful and effective in helping people than an impersonal government 
supplying aid that it has not earned to people it does not know. That's not God's way. And when you think of the, we would think electing deacons, I want you to be thinking about this. It's hard for us because there are all these government programs and they exist and we're living in it and it's hard then to kind of imagine what life would be like if none of it was there. How are we going to educate our children? Deacons. The deacons are going to execute the plan. They're going to be gathering together the funds, moving and, and helping there. We have, we have children that need to be ex, uh, educated. That's the diaconate, the deaconry right there. Other practical needs, wealth, welfare-related matters, other things, hospitals, so on. It is it stems from the community of the church. And as I say, with, with the rise of atheism, get, well, we, we have to worship something, as I said recently. We worship the state. Let the state do it. And now we're, what, $23 trillion in national debt and rising? Because it's inefficient. It doesn't actually work. And if you want to see what can be accomplished when someone with, yes, tremendous gift and connections, but also a will to apply the Scriptures effectively in society, and how powerful that can be. You look at the life of Thomas Chalmers, a 19th century minister in Scotland. He went into an area and in four years caused the, 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 the government welfare that was, was, it wasn't as structured or helpful as it would be today, but there were some monies, and even though it was minimal in terms of government involvement, it was, it was over a quarter, it was, it was cut down to less than, than 25% in four years by the strategy laid out by Chalmers using deacons to go and see where are these needy people, and then instructing them and guiding them. It's amazing what, what happens when a community actually says, okay, this is the Word of God. This is what we're going to live by. It transforms communities. It really does. I think of all, and I'm almost getting sidetracked already, but I think of all the Bible-believing Christians living here in Greenville. I think that there are, there, there are, there's a certain state of conviction that thousands of people have right here. And I, you know better than I do, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But at the very least, a sense of conviction. I'm talking about evangelical people, gospel-believing people, and yet we look at kind of the direction in terms of politics and the governing of the... How is this happening except Christians are not actually living out actively their faith and applying the Word of God. How can the drift happen here? It has to be by an impotence in the church because we're not actually doing what God has called us to do. And here I am, a foreigner, hasn't even got his green card yet, you know, looking and thinking, you know, you know what could be done? if the community actually lived out what the Word of God says. How would it look? How would we elect our representatives? Would there be any inroads for the liberal and their ideology if we truly lived out our faith and pulled together resources to act as God would command us to act? Well, we're coming to an election of deacons, and I want every man who is eligible particularly to think about this, especially as we come to look, and we're just looking quickly over some of, uh, looking at what the, the characteristics that are given, the, the essentials of the deacon, the essentials of a deacon, someone who is placed in the office to be a deacon in the church, and I, I think it should be encouraging for you when you read this. Sometimes you have to think about, well, what does Paul not put in? What does he not put in? He hasn't required that you be white-collar or that you be blue-collar. It's not there. So there should be no one here who thinks because they are on a certain 
level of, of economic status that the, being a deacon is below them. Nor should there be anyone of a certain economic status sh who should think that the deacon is beyond them. Nor should there be any thought about, well, I'm not the kind of outgoing character. It doesn't talk about being outgoing. In fact, this epistle is written to a young man who generally, it is agreed upon, was very timid. Timothy was called to be a preacher, to be a teaching elder, and he was a very timid individual. He was not like Paul. In terms of personality, that's not what he's dealing with. It would be a very sad thing, actually, if you sat, you know, around with all the deacons elected and we're all exactly the same. <laughs> that would really be very helpful, I don't think. You don't want just a room of everyone agreeing for the sake of agreeing. You, you want everyone bringing different perspective, having insight from their lives, and, and that's, that's the desire. Well, let, let's look at this as God gives us help. First, their personal character. Their personal character, reading from verse 8. Likewise, in other words, what has preceded this, in terms of the elders, there's, there's much similarity here. In fact, there's almost no real difference with the exception of the fact that the elder has to be able to teach in some way. The deacon may be able to teach, but he doesn't have to have that ability. So we read, likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. First, he is serious. He's a serious man. He is grave. That is, he is reverent. He is noble. He is worthy of honor. You're not looking at him and thinking, what kind of a man is that to choose to be a deacon? Yeah, there's a sense in which it makes sense. It's, you may use even the word stately. I, I don't want to overemphasize that. But there's, he certainly is not flippant or foolish. He's a grave man. There's a sense of sobriety about him in terms of his, his character, a nobility in the way he lives. He must be like this. This is the way he, sh he ought to be, grave. So don't be thinking of, you know, I like him because he tells the best jokes. Well, being able to make people laugh might have its place in life, but that's not, that's not, you know, the main characteristic. It doesn't mean, of course, that he is to be a person who never smiles either. Oh, he, he's a very grave, very, very sober, very, very noble person as he he, you know, conducts his business <laughs> in a way where he, he never smiles. You don't, that, that's not it either. It's, it's, you understand the distinction, grief. There's a sense if, when he talks about spiritual things, it's not like it's coming out. It's not like Lot. You know, when his, his sons-in-law, he seemed as one like mock, that mocked. He's talking about, it doesn't seem to connect with his actual life. No, no, no. When, when he does, yes, he can laugh and he can joke and he, well, so all of that. But, but when he comes down to spiritual matters, there's not a disconnect. You're not thinking, what? Where did that come from? It, it fits. It fits. He is serious. He's also sincere. We're told that he is not double-tongued. That is to say, he doesn't say one thing to one person and another thing to another person. He is honest. He is truthful. There's a sincerity in the way he speaks. Yes, his speech is important. Not just the general tenor of his life being grave, but his speech is governed. The Lord has control of that. Yes, what a man it is that has control of the little member. And this is to be such a man. Again, we're not perfect here, but this, this, these things are to be looked for. What kind of way does he speak? There's a sincerity and a truthfulness in all of his speech. He is also sober. And that's in the, the practical area of alcohol, not given to much wine. Not given to much wine. That is to say, he is forbidden from giving himself to intoxicating substances, or especially beverages as it would be here. I'm certain you could apply it to all sorts of substances that would intoxicate a man. And of course, many take this lightly today. It's, you know, they read that and think, oh, they, they think about what it is saying they're allowed to do. Oh, well, well we can drink wine. Really? Really? 
Let's, let's give ourselves to social drinking, even if we're deacons. It doesn't matter, just as long as we're not given to much wine, whatever that means. What's much? At what stage is that? What, how do you gauge sobriety? Or on the other side, drunkenness. How do you gauge it? How do you gauge it? What's much wine? Oh, it's drunkenness when you can't walk in a straight line. Or is it when you can't drive, or you'll be, if you're pulled over by the cops, you'll lose your license? Which is it? What should be considered seriously about this is in this very epistle, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy 5, verse 23. Paul says to Timothy, drink no longer water. An exhortation essentially, don't don't just drink water anymore, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Now again, people say, there Paul is giving license to drink. But I read it and I think, hang on a minute here. Paul is exhorting Timothy to drink wine for reasons of health. Which begs the question, what was Timothy doing before? He was not drinking wine. Timothy was a teetotaler. He didn't touch the stuff. He did not drink. Which then makes me ask the question, well, where would he have learned that from? Who was his mentor? Who instructed him? Who guided him? Who shaped his life? Who was it that Paul was able to say, no man is more like-minded than this man? It was Paul that had shaped Timothy's life. So when I asked myself, Timothy decided that he would not drink wine. Why? Because Paul didn't drink wine. Paul didn't touch the stuff. He never touched it. And Timothy followed in the path. However, Timothy is in Ephesus, and Ephesus is a large city, lots of people. It's not the agrarian area that lots of people would have lived in where they would find wells and they'd be very pure and clean. It was a city that was filthy and dirty, and they did not have the water filtration systems that we have today. And Timothy's getting sick, and Paul lived there for three years. Paul perhaps had gotten sick himself while he was there, and he said, no, here's a way to mitigate that. Add a little wine. The alcohol will kill some of the germs. It will help you in your health, your overall well-being. You keep getting sick, add wine to your diet. Don't just drink water, use a little wine. In other words, add the wine to the water, which is what they would have done, of course. They would have diluted it. And so, if you're going to be in office, you need to be very careful with this. Because you need wine to, in some areas, to preserve you from getting sick. It's just a necessity. It's part of that which helped maintain a level of health. Again, in a, in a day that it wasn't like today. Again, I, just put yourself in the position. Timothy doesn't drink. <laughs> Who was he shaped by? He was shaped by Paul. I, I draw from that. You may say you're reading into it. Well, challenge me if you see f- fit to do so. But I, he learned that from Paul, who wanted to be above reproach in everything. But there are certain circumstances that required a pragmatic approach. But here is where the serious matter is. If such is the case, deacons, they, make, they have to make sure they are not given to much wine. They can't let the, the drinking of wine run away from them and lose their testimony. So he's to be sober, practically speaking. A man who is sober, not given to much wine. He's also to be stable, stable financially. You see what it says again, verse 8, not greedy of filthy lucre. 
That is, he's not unstable in his relationship to money. He doesn't give himself to dishonest gain. He doesn't have a heart like Judas. Taking money intended for ministry for his own gain. Can't be such a man as that. So, he, you know, you think about a deacon, he has, to, he, has to, he has to reflect this in terms of his personal character. He has to be serious. There has to be a seriousness in terms of a graveness about his character, a sincerity about his speech, a sobriety practically, and he's not giving himself to substances that cause him to lose his, his way. Oh, how, how, many, how many men have been ruined in ministry? by alcohol or other substances. And then his relationship to money. It's very practical, very practical. You're looking at a man, there's any uncertainty there? You, you don't want such a person to be a deacon. It will hinder him in his work. So their personal character. We also think of their spiritual character. Verse 9. I'm following. We have here spiritual character first in relation to truth holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. That is to say, well, let me explain the word mystery, perhaps. Holding the mystery of the faith. What, what are you talking about? The mystery. Sometimes when we think of that word, we think of something mysterious. Uh, and so he's holding on to something mysterious. You can't really put your finger on what it is, but he's doing that in a pure conscience. But that's not what it is biblically. Mystery in the Word of God, when that term is used, relates to something that man could never have discovered except it was revealed by God. And the mystery of the faith is the gospel. The mystery of the faith is that which God has revealed. How can a sinner be reconciled to God? It is by his Son. No man can invent that. That's not conjured up in the mind of a man. That is God's revelation to men. This is the whole, the whole statement of the faith from Genesis through Revelation. How men are reconciled to God through the work of a Redeemer, even the Son of God Himself. That mystery, which is no longer a mystery to those of us who have received the Word of God, a deacon then has to hold to the gospel, the mystery of the faith. He holds to the truth. A spiritual character in relation to the truth is a man who holds to the divinely revealed Word, the truth as it's revealed in the Scripture. They possess it. They adhere to it. It makes an imprint upon the life. The deacon is a man who knows the truth and is committed to it. And his commitment is evidenced by a pure conscience, verse 9. A pure conscience. In other words, he, he has a mind that is submitted to the truth. He doesn't just say, I believe the gospel but he has a conscience that is submitted to the Word of God and lives his life accordingly. He feels the impact of the Word. He's not one of those people that sits there numb with a heart that can't be moved by Scripture. He's not the kind of person that never feels the impact of the Word. He, he feels the truth most, most powerfully within his own heart. He discusses it. He corrects his life. He considers how vital it is that he obeys God. These things matter to him. And you can see it. It's evident to others. Josiah was such a man. Young Josiah. What a king he was. Wow. The nation spiritually is in utter disarray. One king after another wrecking havoc on the land. And this young man rises up starts making changes. And then they find the Word of God. <laughs> and when they find the Word of God, he is just every single thing. We need to execute all the will of God. He had a pure conscience, submitted to truth. By every power of his being, he was going to do the will of God. We read of him in Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 27, 
where God says, and he can't undo all that Manasseh and so on had done. The judgment is on the way, but this is how the Lord testifies of Josiah. Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Thine heart was tender. He humbled himself before God. And when he heard God's word, he responded. Responded with compassion and love. God of mercy upon this land. Well, such as the deacon. He holds the mystery of the faith. He holds the truth, the gospel, in a pure conscience. He loves it. And that's why he's a deacon in the first place. He loves the Lord. He can never repay him. But he can do what Saul of Tarsus did. Lord, what will thou have me to do? A spiritual character, not just in relation to truth, but also in relation to testimony. In verse 10, we read, and let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Let them first be proved. You don't let someone who's just walked in the door become a deacon. You don't. It's not sensible. It's not wise. They have to, they have to be proved. Their testimony has to be tested. Not just with you know, three or four weeks of nice smiles and nice words at the door and you know, being pleasant to everyone. Yeah, he needs a time of testing. And, and here, in this place, there is a time of testing. Naturally, kind of built into the, the order of it all. So, someone walks in the door, first day, and says, I want to become a member. I mean, well, just, just wait a minute. Just, just, just see. Just see. You know, give it some time. Just you know, sit under the Word. Consider it. See what's going on. And You'll no doubt see that we're not perfect, but if you see that we're a good fit and you, your, your convictions align and so on, then, then we'll talk again in a little while. You give it a few months at least. Let them think it through seriously. And, and then after they become a member, it's at least a year before they can be, can be considered to become a deacon. So, so generally, you're, you're, you know, you're always thinking at least 18 months, if not two years or more, they have been living their life consistently before the people of God. And that kind of builds into this exactly what is said here. Let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon. You, know, you have to make sure there are people who have proved themselves before they come before the, the people to be considered in this way. And then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. When you've looked at them, you, you, you look at their life and you see that they're found blameless. As often as said, make sure you're reading that correctly. It's not saying sinless. Otherwise, that eliminates us all. But there is a sense in which when you look at the life, it is not easy to bring an accusation that will stick. People aren't able to detract from his right to be a deacon by obvious flaws in his character. So, again, you're not nitpicking to the point you're looking for perf perfection. But there are some people, because of their character, because of their conduct, a trust in the wisdom of God, you can see perhaps in your mind that that, that person wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a deacon. I don't, I don't know of anyone here necessarily, but they certainly can exist within the body of Christ and certainly need more time maybe to prove themselves. We are told also, in terms of these men, verse 12, that they be the husbands of one wife. Their spiritual character is such that they are the husbands of one wife. They have chosen, if they have chosen to be married, then he has one woman in his life. <laughs> That's it. It doesn't require that he be married, of course. It doesn't have to be married. That would be drawing something that's not said here. But if this, the man has chosen to be married, then it is obvious that he only has one woman in his life. I 
and he rules his children and his house well. The testimony of the man is the first his, his children under him are, are not rebellious and disrespectful. Again, you're not looking for perfection. You're not looking for perfection. If that's what you're looking for, forget it. You're not going to see perfection in my family. But you trust there's a measure of, of there being... He, he, there is, put it this way, there is the effort to rule. There is the effort to rule, not with a heavy hand, not heavy shepherding of the family, but with active shepherding of the family. So he rules. He, he's a man who's, who's taken on the responsibility. I'm a father. I'm going to take that on. That requires certain responsibilities. That means that I, I don't just let my children grow up and just feed them. They grow up, but I actually raise them. <laughs> I teach them and instruct them. I'm involved in their lives. Again, it's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. And our children will go through seasons at times where they will test us. But are we ruling even in those moments? Are we ruling? In those times when we have children that are, are going wayward or going through certain periods of, of, their, of, of just being challenging, are we, are, are, are we just sitting back and letting it happen and all kind of fall apart? Or are we trying by the help and grace of God to guide and to lead? And if you see men, at the very least, they're, they're actively involved, seeking to guide, to teach, then that, that's what's being asked of them. They rule their children and they do it well. They take the responsibility and they do it. And generally, generally, there will be a level of respect that will be observed in the children and their houses as well, even how they manage their, their home affairs. Their home affairs are not in disarray. There, there's a sense in which there, there's an orderliness. Again, this, this does not fall, notice this, the orderliness of the home does not fall upon the wife. It comes on the man. He's the one responsible for home economics, the structure of the home. He's the one that has to sit down, and I tell this, when I, I speak to young people and they're entering into marriage, I, I look directly at the young man and I say, every single circumstance in the home, it falls on you. And so if things are not getting done, it's not about pointing the finger and blaming, it's about sitting down and talking. How can I help? How can we restructure things here? How can we aid? How can we lift the burden or whatever needs to be done? That's, that's your duty. You're, you're governing. It's not, you just foist it off and say, it's all her fault. No, it is your responsibility to govern the home and to lead. And it, it can lead to all sorts of different decisions within the family sometimes you find that the wife is much better financially than he is. Well, it's up to him to see that and say, look, you're better at this than I am. Here you go. <laughs> Just give me 20 bucks for Starbucks and Chick-fil-A twice a week or whatever, and I'll be happy. And, and, and you, know, you recognize gift. But, but there has to be, he, he's involved. You see that? He's ruling the house, and he's ruling it well. Not perfectly, but he is involved. He is involved. And the wife then, she's pointed out also in verse 11, this man, if he's married, he's going to be a deacon. Well, his wife is addressed. It's interesting that the elders' wives are not addressed, but I think there's lots that carries into both. There's a lot of overlap here. And so in verse 11, even so must their wives be grave. They're, they're noble characters as well. Not slanderers. You know, I do say to men in office that generally speaking, it's much wiser not to pass on information to your wife. Just get into the mode that you, don't, you, you come home from the meeting and you don't talk about everything you just discussed. That's really hard to do. Sometimes you have that feeling you just kind of need to offload what went well or what did not. What happened, 
And to, to say, she doesn't need this burden. She doesn't need that burden. Sometimes it's necessary. It may involve her. I mean, you both need to tackle something, help with something, deal with a matter, or it's going to become public knowledge. Anyway, it's an announcement that's going to be made or whatever. That's fine. But be very cautious. It's much easier for my wife to not be a slanderer. She simply doesn't know anything. <laughs> this is a very strong word. Very strong. It relates to the work of the devil. False accuser. It's very important that you wives be praying very much about your husbands and your, your, your job is to be a support. You're not called to be a deacon in the office, but you are called to support those who will be appointed to that office. Also sober and faithful in all things. Faithful. A faithful wife who can find. But they're there. And hopefully they're there in the lives of the deacons, those that are married, that they are faithful. They're faithful in all things. There's just a general faithfulness, a trustworthy respected woman. This, this is, these are the things to consider. And again, it's not to look at it and say, well, that writes me off. <laughs> Be very, very slow to simply say, that's not me, because there's a, there's a sense in which it's not any of us. None of us perfectly manifest all of these things. But it's a little like the fruit of the Spirit. I don't manifest love perfectly or joy perfectly or long-suffering perfectly and temperance and so on. I don't manifest it all perfectly, but it should be there. It should exist to some degree in the child of God. And in the deacon, these things exist not completely devoid of these characteristics and requirements. So consider that. Consider it you personally, you men. You go through all of these things. This is, this is, all of this can be applied to every Christian. These things are necessary for every believer. While you may not be a deacon, you, you are to be like this as a Christian. And so while you may sit there and think, well, obviously that's not going to be for me. If you're thinking that, if you're thinking it's not going to be me, you must be asking yourself then, why? Why? And is there a way in which I can correct that? Not to drift along and keep yourself from being available as a deacon in a church when it is in your power to change and to live out the will of God in such a way that would eventually make you capable. Now this is, this is a serious matter. And you can see why. Verse 15. Paul has written these things, verse 14. He hopes to get there to in person help Timothy. But if I tarry long, I've written these things that you, you know how to behave yourself in the house of God. There is a behavior. There is a, an organizing in the house of God. There's a right way. And you know, when, when a church lives all this out very seriously, it takes it seriously and seeks to apply it to the best of what is available to them. It's not just having an impact in the present. It's having an impact in the future. It's having a long-term impact in, in relation to the entire atmosphere of the body. And we want to be creating in this local congregation a place that is governed according to the Scriptures. We don't want a deaconry who don't know how to care for those in need it may not be there's many people right now that are in need. It's not for me to even elaborate upon. But what if the day comes? 
What if the day comes when there's tremendous economic difficulty? Has this body the right teaching and instruction to know how to respond? That's what you're, you're, all of these things are vital. And their character, their nature makes them willing to take the Word of God, even as we've taught it in terms of the duties of the deacon, to take it on and say, yes, that's my duty, and I'm going to carry it out to the best of my ability. A willing heart, a willing soul, a teachable spirit who will give themselves to the work as best they can and simply, again, <laughs> Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And that's where we are this morning. Am I to remove my name from that? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Think seriously about it. Don't, don't take it away just because you, you've never been a deacon before or you don't want to be one. Why, why don't you want to be one? What will thou have me to do? What will thou have me to do in relation to who, Lord? Who are the men for this time? These are the prayers we should be offering to God. May the Lord bless his word. Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, we commit our way to Thee. There, there's a whole area of the work of deacons that has been in some way taken from Thy church by the state. But Lord, help us. Help us not to look to the state. Make us a community involved in each other's lives. To live in such a way, to some degree, to ignore all of those things, not completely ignore them, but to, but to be very careful that we're not just removing ourselves from our responsibility. Help us to do what Thou hast called us to do. May there be a well-functioning diaconate in this place and every member ministry, every person pulling together but especially then those that will be elected to office for a season Thou wilt bless this process and bless the men in the will of God who will come together and function in this body God, we pray for thy blessing. Leave us not without good men. God, give us good men. Not perfect men. Or we would eliminate ourselves. But good men. Men of heart. Men who love the gospel. And men who are willing to serve as thou wilt appoint. Lead us, guide us, help us through what lies before May our minds be much dwelling upon these things and praying over them. Hear our prayer. Be with us in our fellowship. Be with us in our homes this afternoon. And God, may thy presence be with us as we gather again this evening. And may there be friends and family gathered with us to worship thee this night. In the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with all thy people now and evermore. Amen.